It's springtime in Blackwood Point National Park. Here's what to know before you go. Bring a map. You could get lost out there. Watch your step so you don't get caught in the snags and brambles. Use the buddy system. The woods are wild and full of predators. And most importantly, keep noise to a minimum. This isn't a place for you kids to party. Hey everyone, this is Matt Stewart with the Simplistic Reviews Podcast, and this is another Simplistic Interview. Um, now, the last time we did an interview, we were um, blessed enough to interview a great documentarian who is, did a documentary about the scary stories books that we all grew up in love and probably read to, these day, to this day. However, I have an even more special guest, not to sell him short, of course, but I do have a very interesting young lady here, Heather Buckley, a uh, producer, uh, journalist, writer extraordinaire. Uh, thank you so much for coming on to the Simplistic Reviews podcast, Heather. Hello there. It's a very it's it's an honor to be on your podcast. I recently was in when I was in New York City. I saw a small preview of Scary Stories. Mm. It looked so much fun, and Del Toro was there, and the director and. It's very nice. That's the fun thing about being in New York. Uh, you never know who you're going to run into or what you're going to see. I, I live in Nashville right now currently. So, uh, And while I do love Nashville, it's no comparison to the scene in New York. But uh, I'm, I'm super stoked for that film. The new trailer came out today as well. So shed a little bit more light on a few things. But I digress. We'll get into that. I'm sure we're going to go on plenty of tangents this entire show. But I uh, want to know a little bit more about you, Heather, uh, to give the, give the, the masses, the audience, the, uh, the freaks and weirdos out there, a little, a little taste of who you are. I'm, uh, I'm from, uh, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I started life as a visual artist. I would then move into the advertising space of New York city for many years. And then I transformed like a, um, I guess like a death head moth out of, uh, <laughs> to become, a genre film producer of documentary films for a lot of distribution companies and most recently the ranger the ranger yes that's why we're that's what kind of brought us all here um having that be on shutter and be accessible to everybody i know it did some excellent things in, back in 2018 now, it, now the ranger it premiered did it premiere at south by southwest or were, were you kind of shopping that around previous to south by southwest um, as well it premiered at South by Southwest. Thank you so much, Jarrett Nice. And mm -hmm. uh, it made it, um, it made a lovely splash in Austin, which is another sort of like music city, the way Nashville is. Mm -hmm. Everybody likes to say, um, Austin always, always says, you know, keep Austin weird. Nashville likes to kind of, I feel like having visited Austin, now living in Nashville, Nashville does crib a lot of stuff from Austin. I feel like Austin does it first and Nashville kind of follows soon afterwards in a lot of respects but uh yeah both to you know the music city west and music city east almost uh, now a little bit more about you um like okay genre of the horror is your forte you've been watching it forever i'm sure like forever. me you've been watching it since you were you know old enough to really understand what horror probably really was um now what's what's the what were your parents like i mean obviously we're all a little sick and twisted probably because of our parents and what they let us watch and what they let, let us get away with. But um, watching horror your entire life, were your parents cool with this? Were they, did they say like, yes, you need to watch horror? Or were they a little bit more kind of like, I don't know, Heather, this man, this, how about this here? But or were you rebellious that screw it, I'm watching horror all the time? I was a free range horror child. So while my <laughs> mother didn't watch it, my father would have stuff on like the fly Mm -hmm. on cable and poltergeist and so i would walk into scenes of a little girl of like jeff goldblum in pieces and people <laughs> their faces off and i was really skittish as a kid 
and it bothered me. But I always told people, like, it took a while for me to be enough of an outsider to identify with Jason Voorhees one day because it was my metalhead friends who went like, Heather, stop being afraid of fucking horror movies. We want to talk about them. It's like, just watch it again. So it was probably something on USA Channel that I watched one of the Friday the 13th movies, mm -hmm. and I went like, I understand the imagery now. And so... And that also dovetailed at the same time I discovered punk music through the movie Fear No Evil. Okay. I was just watching a whole bunch of a whole bunch of horror films. So that happened around when I was 13 years old. And I remember going to my father, which is it's so wonderful you asked this question, going to my dad, <laughs> and it's like, Dad, can you take me to the Fangoria Weekend of Horrors in New York City? And he was, of course I can, with his Jersey City accent. It's like, when I was in Vietnam, I wanted to get Frankenstein Monster tattooed on my back, but I thought my dad would kill me. So I didn't know secretly the reason those things were, on, were in the den is because my father was a huge horror fan. He talked to me about famous monsters of Filmland and having them and having the first edition and watching all these movies. I had no idea, he, because he didn't show them to me. I had no idea. So we would go to the Fangoria conventions together. We would go to other conventions together. He would take me to the movies to see like Pet Cemetery and Chainsaw 3. And my sister would, would, would come with me. And what else did we do? And to this day, it's like, I will, I will buy him horror movies. I will buy him horror movies that I have people autograph for him, specifically like Glass Eye, Larry has autographed so many things for him. <laughs> when I go to conventions, it's like Chris Elvira and, you know, everyone is that he, he loves it. He thinks it's great, which is why he has a cameo in The Ranger. Oh, okay, okay. Well, he is... Hmm. He is on one of the missing ads. Uh, of course he is. Perfect, and it's, and I did not expect this to happen, but there's like a, it's a full mid-frame pan of his name. <laughs> is that something you have to like, it's like, Jen, look, this is really important. You have to get this really good pan of the missing poster of my dad. I did not. <laughs> it's like, this is hilarious. So he's, and he donated a lot of stuff for the movie. And he's 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 always game. I'm always looking for acting gigs to him because it's good for him to get away from his wife. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that makes a lot of sense then too. So. Yeah, my mom. It's, it's like it's good that he gets out of the house because they're both retired. So it's like get my dad out of the house. It's like, look, I gotta go. I gotta go start another movie with exactly. my with with, your, with exactly. our daughter. Our daughter's making big moves here in Hollywood, and I gotta start. An, I gotta be in another missing ad, or maybe I'll be in a wanted poster next time. He's very, he's yeah. very good at playing <laughs> monsters. He's very good if you need like a mafioso because he has a great Hudson County accent. So he's <laughs> available. He's available. But, uh, so w w when you told your, I mean, was it one of these things that he? I guess he secretly, or he didn't know that you were secretly, like, I guess, spying on his horror habits and everything like that. But it sounded like he was so into it. He's like, why did you come to me sooner or something like that? Like, um, and he, he was just, he's, he's a very, he's a very stoic man of his generation. So it was pretty much in stride. It's like, oh, it's just, of course, I'll go with you. Of course. He's just, he's, he's very, he's very laid back. That's awesome. I mean, it's like, I, I remember growing, like, like you were saying, watching things on USA. So it was either up all night or something like that, watching yep. the horror movies there. Yep. Of course, you know, everybody grew up with Joe Bob Briggs with Monster Vision and, and, and things like that as well. And I remember just staying up till all hours in the night. I mean, and sometimes I would have to watch it on mute because my parents would say, what are you, what are you doing up? Like, why are you still up watching cable at two, three in the morning? It's like, I don't know can't go to sleep anymore because I'm watching her horrific uh, shit on uh, Up All Night or Monster Vision or something like that. But I mean, now when you were watching, the, when you were, when you started getting in, you said you were kind of like, I don't know about the genre. And it took like, you know, getting into the, into the, in, with like all your, all the metalheads, the punk and all the punk rock friends and stuff like that. Was there any, and ever any a point where you were kind of like, I don't know, the genre might not be for me and you wanted to watch something else. Or is this just something that was always drawn to you? Like no matter what, horror was going to be your future, like from the first time you watched a horror film. That's exactly, that's exactly what it was. I understood and loved the imagery. And it's like, because Mike Gingle, who's an editor of 
Bangori we were talking mm. about it's like it's like well the movie's not scary and I go I don't watch movie, horror movies because they're scary I watch them because I deeply identify with the imagery with the monsters the sort of dark elevated space this very visionary space so mm. as soon as I started you know with with new eyes watching genre and not just beautiful elevated stuff what we considered elevated back in the day but like mm-hmm. spookies ghoulies too yeah chainsaw too it's like all this all this stuff and i also watched which i loved which was more emotionally raw stuff because my parents would let me watch the original 1974 chainsaw i have no idea why but they, <laughs> they were great parents that's why i mean come on they, no no but they would let me watch a clockwork orange and wild at heart Perfect. Okay. Well, you know, exactly. orange, and then a, a a take on the the Wizard of Oz. There's nothing wrong with the you know Wild at Heart. <laughs> mm-hmm. So this is this is they had very strange lines where I was on, but that's where I I started to like these sort of very strong exploitation art films mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. Lynch, and then I would go to Green Away at a very young age, and I was also reading at the time Fangoria Toxic Horror Gore Zone, mm-hmm. and then and the very changing article in Gorzo Magazine by Steve Bissett with my eyes peeled mm-hmm. and a lot of Tim Lucas's work. I'm talking about genre in a very sophisticated way. Yeah, of course. I'm talking about genre in a broader scope because I remember reading, you know, Steve Bissett wrote about Kenneth Anger and Stan Brackage in his articles and that all, that shaped the, the stuff that I like because I like like transgressive art, hard yeah. drama, and then also genre, of a genre in its full stripes again, beautiful dramas, quiet, gorgeous dramas to like terror vision. Yeah. So I love it all. Yeah, you, you, you run the spectrum of everything and, and yeah. it's important to, you know, because a lot of them, of course, horror, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's cribbed so many different, like horror is horror, but you know, they, they copy from some of the best as well too. And so, um, now you bring up Fangoria, and I'll even bring up like uh, Diablo and things like that. Now, growing up and reading Fangoria, and then eventually writing for somebody like Fangoria, what was that like? The jump from just merely watching the films to saying like, "Oh shit, I got a platform now where I can actually talk about these films, and I'll have reputable people reading what I think about these films." What, what was Man. that? What was that jump like? That was so not my process. So what <laughs> happened was. In my household, I have all my Fangorias and 90s Fantico slipcases. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you can tell the Gore Zone because I have the little like clicky clicky sticker thing that like wrote Gore Zone because I was very well organized. So that was Gore Zone one. And then I had clipping books from the Star Ledger and all the different newspapers of like Candyman, Chainsaw, mm-hmm. Pet Cemetery 2, everything that came out. So I would read reviews and I would, I, I created an archive of books, a 13 year old. Wow. Okay. Because I said that I would have to write about horror. Now, my career at that time, because I was a visual artist, I was not a writer, mm-hmm. and then I went to college to be a designer. So, mm-hmm. like, all visual medium. But I'd, I, when I was asked originally to write for Dread Central, it was Paul Nicolasi reached out to me during the MySpace days. He okay. kept wanting to be my friend, and I kept going, I don't know who you are. And then <laughs> I found out that he lived so close to my house that I, where, where I was raised in the middle of nowhere, New Jersey, that he was like eight or 10 minutes away, which is ridiculous. So I said, now we got to hang out because it's weird. <laughs> and then we hung out and he goes like, you, so much, you know so much about horror, you should meet the guys at Dread Central. And then I went to a convention in Texas. I met everyone and everyone was go, going, this girl knows so much about horror and has such a unique voice. Why don't you have her write for Dread Central? And so Uncle Creepy sat me down and went like, Heather, do you want to write for Dread Central? That is how that happened. Never in my wildest dreams that I pursue writing, journalism, putting this stuff together, other than somehow they may have been able to say like, this girl has Fangoria slipcases. Yeah. (laughs) We have to hire her, of course. Maybe we need to hire her. Maybe that came down to it. But that's, it's nothing that I pursued the same with uh, Fangoria. I had someone pitch me in while Chris Alexander was was editing it. So it's just, so it's an incredible dream. It's something that I didn't expect it. And what I felt is that I always go back to Little Heather. Without my gore zones, my fangorias, all the writing on genre, I would not be the person that I am today. Also, shout out to another important book is uh, uh, Homerman's Midnight Movies. Okay. Incredibly important to me. 
Mm-hmm. I love him as I love him as a critic. But that sort of writing and exposure to certain sort of films, I always and I feel the same way with the DVD uh, supplement stuff that I do. Just want to give back and give this content to the little Heather's to learn to learn about the genre, to have these stories. And if someone tells me these great things during their, during interviews, gives me these beautiful gems, I need to share them with the world. And we need more little Heathers out there. I know, of course, now they're... Hard to be a little Heather. It may be slightly easier now, but in the 90s, it's hard to be a little Heather. Oh, no. I mean, even now in, in 2019, I mean, that's still the big hurdle we're trying to get over, of just, you know, the lack of female representation, female critics. It's female anything, you know. Yes. My, yes no, lack of minority, lack of, like, every... every and I'm I'm speaking as a white male a middle a 30 year old white male and you see it and it's like I'm, I'm tired myself of hearing what white men have to say all the time because they're not really adding much to the discourse anymore because they're they've been doing it for so long so um now you i mean so we need more low heathers i can't reiterate that enough more low heathers need to be out there and running around writing about horror writing about any genre um that That's also why I do my intros and my Q and A's in New York City and in Yonkers because the idea of seeing like a six foot tall girl with a bihawk talking about deer Hell hunting, yeah. very culturally culturally significant and important to me. Because the I also am interested in the idea of the ownership space is because mm-hmm. horror and punk were always me, yep. and, and you know watching movies like The Dirty Dozen with my father that is also me. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things that are that are me to sort of not like limit what sort of the uh the feminine might be into absolutely um now you're all of that yeah and um with, with that being said like you're you're a huge producer i mean like like you were saying before you've done so many behind the scenes things like looking at like your your imdb page things like that i mean like 150 production credits that's yeah. out of this friggin' world um now you're you're obviously a student of the genre you grew up in the genre you love the Correct. genre think about Correct. the genre now what kind of what, what 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 kind of gravitated you towards like producing a lot of these behind the scenes docs? Was it just like the love of like, I love these movies so much. I want to know every single thing about this. Another movie. story, yeah. another story. Of More stories. I love stories. Yes. Yes. So I was just getting off Ted Gagan's film. We are still here, which I was doing the special effects shop supervision on. Mm-hmm. And I remember I had this background, this private background in advertising, which means that I'm working on, cross-disciplinary management and I'm working on multi-million dollar accounts and things like that but like in my meantime I would write for Fangoria and Dread Central and hang out at Fantasia Film Fest because it was like where my heart is I I loved it I loved interviewing Mm. so I was at a at Fantasia Film Fest once and someone said like Heather what is your day job and I told him my day job was is that creative lead advertising all this stuff like that and they said like Heather you should think about being a producer so I was in Detroit, I was hanging out with Don May and the Synapse guys, and mm-hmm. they go, you can't ride in my car because we have all this product in the back of our car that we we're going to go to Horror Hound. He says, you're going to have to ride in Mike Felcher's car. Right. Okay. So I know who Mike Felcher was, because my writing partner, Ethan, is like on about Mike Felcher, and he's, we, we loved extras, and he's an incredibly funny, generous guy. And so while I was in the car with him, I was telling him the history is that when I worked on We Are Still Here, people went like, I feel she has a, you know, a quality to be a producer or doing the shop supervision. And then when I talked to some of my peers and they would go like, you should, you should be a producer. And it's like, I just, I was just telling him, this is sort of like in film world, what people bring up all the time, really not knowing what that, what that is or what that meant. Mm-hmm. And he was like, Heather, and he goes, I have this uh, saw doc to put out for Lionsgate. Do you want to produce it for me? And I went, well, we're friends, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it out for two weeks. And if I fail, take it away from me. Don't, you know, don't pay me or anything like this because we're friends. And after two weeks, he was like, Heather, you're doing an incredible job. We're going to keep doing this. And that is how, this is why DVD Supplement Master. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. And somebody I mean, is getting in a car with Michael Felster on the way to Horror Hound. And I want to tell you about his amazing ability, other than doing all this great stuff and being a legend of the DVD supplement field. He's very good at claw animal stuff. Really? Okay. Magical, a magical ability. Because as we were driving there, we would like stop at places and it's just his ability to get stuff with the claw. So this is <laughs> this also would further, you know, cement his legend as well. Master cool. of the claw. 
DVD supplement master. So what, he, what, what was his claw animal go to? I guess. I, I didn't, I didn't ask strategically because a lot of times when I would use the claw when I was, was, was down the shore in Jersey, because I'm yeah. pretty good at the claw. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm going for things that stick out a little more or we're in a certain area. And also you got to make sure like the claw is not weak, but I felt that he could get anything. I nope. felt there was no strategy that he, he went like, that's mine. And it just was. He was like the rain man of the claw machine, basically. Like next level of Jedi. I'm just sort of like at the training at the training level. It's like this one looks easy. I think we could get it. The claws not too weak. So I I would I would do that for a while, and then other people would ask me. Like David Gregory would ask me for Severn Films, and I worked over True to Living Dead and Ninth Configuration, and then Kino Lober, Elijah Drenner, um, mm -hmm. put in some some good words. And I was hired at Kino, which I've been doing a lot of mm -hmm. great stuff for them now. But for me, it's like archiving because I was, for me, it was my rock stars were the FX people and the VFX people. Mm -hmm. And the idea to reach out and archive how everything is made, the granular level of production, which I feel like a lot of the DVD stuff that I work on with my partner Ethan and like my 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 amazing editors that I that I work with is trying to get how you make it in every image possible because regardless of the films that are made and a lot of folks look down at genre or mm -hmm. horror i think every film that was ever made needs to be archived we need to care about finding the mechanical slug head in a serious way because i tried to get the our listeners at home images of the mechanical slug head for the slug this from arrow but mm -hmm. i was not able to convince the, the directors uh, um daughter that like we really need this stuff for history but i know i know it's out there i know it's out there because i was i was able to uh to get close so it, it's it's been you you're you're on the search so the mechanical slug head is the next like is that's your holy grail at this point right now you have to find this and document this thing it right is now. i was very lucky that a project that i'm working on i was able to locate lance anderson because i couldn't find him for my thing disc to talk mm. about his work with stan winston but i got him for this disc and and I do reach out to everyone. I go like, it's an honor. Cause for me, it's an incredible honor. Or when I get to like call up ILM for my deep rising disc or call up spectral motion. Yeah. I just, it's just too much. I just, I, I love it. I love it. And then I also do when they're, when I'm in New York city or I have a special request to fly over. And I was actually, I was the one time I was in Asheville was to shoot an interview. Is that oh. I, mm -hmm, that I, to, to, to sit there and be present and open and receive these great stories of how you make stuff and the craft and the process is incredibly, incredibly important. No, I mean, and and then, you, but the need to share, cause that's the whole point. The need is like, it's like one, we should be talking about all these films at this level of depth and art because mm -hmm. it, it's there legitimately. Mm -hmm. And then talking to these folks, and disseminating the wisdom out into the world and and trying to like with an archival brain go after these films that are super important to me no i mean and and i think you hit the nail on the head with it because as, as we kind of get more digital and you know physical media kind of goes away and everything just goes into a cloud at the end of the day a lot of people just don't seem to really care how their movies are made it's just a matter of uh when they're made, how much how much money they make, and that's really at box office. Um, now, when you're interviewing, like, do you have do you have a preference of when you're talking about people who are doing you know, VFX and S, you know, uh, special effects and things like that? Are you more keen on interviewing the people that were doing it back in the '80s and they were doing everything just far more, you know, re like using real makeup, using this or people that are just doing everything digital now with special effects and computers and things like that. What, what's, are you more of a practical effects person? Or are you more of all the VFX or the special, I mean, not even VFX, but like at a special effects type of person, or do you love them both? I mean, I love them both. And always remember is that your VFX guys back in the day were people were our heroes at ILM. Mm -hmm. were people that were doing my favorite thing, which is like hand animated rotoscope lightning. <laughs> they're the people with cloud tanks. They're the people doing your miniature work, like all the miniature work that we archived on the Buckaroo Banzai disc. So all the artists are very important. 
And today, a lot of the VFX or erasing stuff out, compositing, I love when they go into creature designs and digitally erase to create a sort of uncanny feel, mm -hmm. as long as it looks good. Because yeah. I'm also a huge fan of artifice, which is stop motion. Obviously, the backgrounds are sets, very stylized creatures. So it's okay to me that it's like almost like young, young Schmankmeyer's stuff, a little Otec. You know that thing is not there, but I'm endeared with sort of like the doll-like quality of, of, of the stop motion of it. I have, I have many sort of like wands of emotion that I could put out that feels like different sorts of movies. Yeah. I mean, but I love, a Mupp I love a Muppet. I love a miniature. Mm -hmm. Again, favorite things in, in life. Cloud tank, hand animated rotoscope lightning. Now I was talking to my friend, Kevin, and he was tell I asked him about rotoscope lightning because he worked on Big Trouble in Little China and all amazing, ama amazing, amazing stuff. And he was telling me is that you take a pencil with three different widths, so three different type of pencils, and mm -hmm. then you would try to draw down because I was saying like when I saw these things and, and then like something wicked this way comes that there's some sort of mm -hmm. consciousness in mm -hmm. the animation. And, and I felt after talking to him, of course there is, because someone, a human consciousness is directing the lines, directing the art, yeah. draw down. And it's just, I, I love that stuff. If I ever make something that requires that, I would love instead of it being uh, in the computer, mm -hmm. that the, the post effect would be, uh, would be hand animated. Just yep. because I think the I think the vibe is so strange. Has there been one person in particular that you've just been blown away to figure out their method and to figure out how they did their special effects and they, like that you were starstruck? I mean, I'm, I mean, I get starstruck a lot. It's probably why I don't talk to a lot of people because I probably just shrivel into a ball if I met any of my heroes most of the time. But was well, there any, anybody? Every single one of them are my heroes. I think the 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 most coolest thing that I was able to do is from a tip from a VFX archivist. I know Gene, he mentioned that ILM keeps all of the movies they work on and that I was able to get like three gigabytes or even, 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 even more mm -hmm. of the behind the scenes of making Deep Rising, which is on a disc. Oh, wow. So they just had like, send us a drive. They filled it, they filled it up and it had like, stop animation like how tentacles move through space and all this test footage and when I get that stuff it's like I really I'm really moved or like when I get interviews with like Richard Edlund or Phil Tippett it's like you can't even you can't even like I emotionally can't handle it because the guys are so important to me anyone who created ILM any of these uh these 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 greats in the VFX field and FX field Talking to anybody at Kane B, Todd Masters, Steve John, like all, all those guys, all those guys are and super important. They, they paved the way and they're still paving the way. I mean, there's a reason why ILM and, is. Yeah, I did. That's leader. why I did some special effects shop supervision because I appreciate that department and the struggles of it. It's a lot of struggles that I dealt with doing uh, my design work is that there was, they weren't clear the magic that we did as visual artists. So the idea of explaining to like, the MBAs and the clients, like the process and the time that we need. And that's sort of how I broke down doing my VFX shoots. I mean, it, I was there as a supervisor to go, we need this time. These are the materials and just really cl clearly state how things are made. So we understand why we need the time. Cause it's something I had to do in my, in my in my old life and, and, and advertising and design it's like this is why we need the time because this is how it's made and mm -hmm. clear and again very clearly to discuss it but i felt very proud that i was able to you know stand up for the sfx team it was very good very cool now uh kind of going into other projects outside of doing a lot of behind the scenes and kind of art basically doing a lot of archiving and uh pretty much great, keeping the history uh, of the genre now with uh, films like you know we are still here um you know you're doing the special effects on that and doing a lot of other work on that how did that help you kind of segue you know three years down the line or you know two years down the line during the production of the ranger what was like how much did you learn from we are still here that kind of paved the way for the ranger in a lot of ways 
what paved the way for the Ranger was my, was all my years in advertising and design, my ability to pitch to client and do cross disciplinary management and to do feedback on creative. And my cross disciplinary management is the idea of talking to different people in different positions that are building your project and sort of creating an, an empathy and a clarity. That mm -hmm. stuff helped me do the, uh, do the special effects stuff because I also understood the value and needs of people in different positions on the film. Because yeah. as I mentioned that in, in a design world, I would have to talk to clients, talk to my account team inside. It's like, this is why we need time. This is how it works to create that almost, almost empathy and information to run my projects in a certain way. It's the same thing I did using, using FX stuff. I mean, the idea is that I loved being on set got along with got along with folks was really nice but that's why i was able to do it so i did it and i did one part of it which is like i'm going to organize this group of people but it was it was travis stevens on we are still here it's like heather needs to go be a producer because i could do it macroscopically which is what my what my old career was like i tell people like i'm a creative director within within the uh, the film space because I'm going to feedback, mentoring, I'm there to listen to something. I understand the, the language of creativity. I know how to make stuff. I care about the history of filmmaking. I understand the audience and marketing part of the thing that you're making, of like all of us out there that love horror and obsessed with horror, what that timeline is, who the actors are, the history of it. So it's like all those, those things together help me work on the ranger because the original like jen had me read the script and i wrote the marketing plan but i thought the marketing plan would be on the on the top on the first page of the script you know talking about that we should do like thrash punk because it's much more like upbeat yeah and you know you'd be able to like dovetail into the different you know audiences music audience horror audience girl power audience of the segments and i just really i really supported her but my first thing i did and Jen asked me to be a producer on the project is I wanted to pitch to investors because I thought my ability to contextualize creative, would I be able to pitch to investors and create sort of like that, that situation because I used to write creative briefs and everything like that. So it worked. No. And, uh, and what was, I, I mean, obviously Jen, Jen, uh, this is her future debut or this was her future debut. Um, and she also wrote it as well too. Um, now, what, when you saw that it was, did now did you guys talk about like, hey, I want to make a punk rock splatter slasher film? Basically, I'm sure you were already like, oh fuck yes, we're gonna do this because this is like my lifestyle and this is what I, my whole life has come to this one moment where we can finally make the punk rock horror film that everybody deserves. Um, I got a story there too. I want to hear it. That's why right. I'm setting you up. You're just knocking okay. it down right now. <laughs> yes. So, Den Wexler, close friend, my sister, Witch, which within the horror film mm -hmm. world in New York City. I loved her very much. Also, believe in people pursuing their dreams, like mm -hmm. very, very punk rock point of view. And so, yeah. when I read the script, she had the script around for 10 years. It came from working with her friend at the time, Jocko, who is the co-writer of the script in Philadelphia University Art School, where she went to. And oddly enough, I went to. It's very strange. Mm -hmm. And Small so <laughs> she wanted to make this movie. And I like, I wanted her to make this movie because this is her dream. But I know reading it is that I would be able to offer something that no one else would be able to offer because of how I look and my lifestyle choice. And that mm -hmm. I could invite the community to be a part of this movie with her. Yeah. Um, you know, have access to an amazing music supervisor, Mitter Goodwin, have access to amazing design team, Mr. Lobo and Dixie to like hand screen print patches and do our vinyl cover and like make all these band logos and then make the posters that are that are on the wall. Mm -hmm. I know I would be able to hawk over the style of everybody in the film because I've dressed this way for a very long <laughs> time. And when I was breaking it down, I'm going like, I'm crazy. How do you why do I naturally know what diameter of lace needs to be in a boot? 
I don't, I don't know. But like somehow, as natural as the day is long, <laughs> like you got to straight lace them and they need to be this diameter, it needs to be this kind of boot. But I, I, I naturally gravitate towards that look in their gear. I taught everybody to use the word gear, which is a very New York way of saying our clothing. Mm -hmm. comes, uh, it shipped over from how the, uh, the, the English folk talk about their... The soccer they're gear and everything like that, yeah. The gear, the gear. Well, because they call their... kits. Oh, they're so, like, my, my kit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They call it their gear. So when I was in London, like, I thought people would be over my look, but they completely embraced it. And it's like, I love everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> everyone enjoys my look. It's so great. So that's, so that's how that happens. And I would, I would show her pictures from my tumblr account of like 80s tacky colors because you want it to be like lisa frank mm -hmm. and then i was showing her like punk rock pictures just for inspiration because again like die in the wool creative director always like want to give people inspiration like i'm thinking about your project and it was mm -hmm. never to like work on it it was just like i want you to do it this is your dream is like being like being like in the corner being in rocky's corner all the time yeah. that's why i feel like as a producer it's like we're gonna do this it's gonna be awesome you got this. It's like, it's all, all that sort of, all that sort of stuff. And then creating a beautiful community around it to, to get it done. And being from Jersey city area, it's like, we, we're here to get it done. <laughs> Time's wasted. <laughs> Jer Jer Jersey stand up. Like everybody always says, Jersey stand up. It's true. <laughs> it's true. So that's, so that's how that, that happened. Now, uh, I also kind of like the dynamic of like punks in the woods a little bit too, because you don't really see a lot of punk rockers in the woods per well, se. You saw me uh, producing it, and I would, I would always make that joke. It's like we're making a movie about punks in the woods, and I am in the woods where I don't want to be. Yeah, this is the exact <laughs> opposite. I, I need to be in a, a New York City or Jersey alleyway or something like that, waiting for whatever bands coming up at the. No, the, the shittiest dive bar I can be at or something like that like that. It's but true, instead, my allergies are horrible, and I always <laughs> felt like if Jason Voorhees came after me in the woods. It's like my lungs would have already collapsed from <laughs> the mold and mildew around me. So there was that the entire time. I like wore my engineer boots with spurs, house dress, like a motherfucker bandana, like L I M F suicidal tendency hat, like my black <laughs> near hardcore glasses, and like my like shitty black fur coat with like patches on it and safety pins like every day every day on set that's what it's like this is this is how punks go camping this is my camping gear at this point so don't, loved, don't fuck with me. Jen, loves the na Jen loves nature it's like i'm not i'm not a fan i like i like being in new york city so i thought it was hilarious it's also because that's in, in the film as well because she tracks very close to the the chelsea character sort of like her her avatar around the world yeah yeah now um another thing that's interesting too uh like having basically like you know a gay romance in, in the film so to speak um now did that come from anything that jen had experience with or you had experience with like what was the dynamic because you don't see that and plus you know it's interracial couple as well who love each other and you know it, it doesn't play big but i it's something that people just don't see on screen i think it's something that whole horror genre is still a little scared of is dealing with you know uh queer characters uh sometimes representation mm -hmm. is so important in the in the genre because if you love something so much and genre is something that people like fucking love they yeah. love the idea that you would love something and not see yourself in it to me is incredibly tragic so the idea of those characters i believe came from a jocko one of the co-writers and it was just for representation yeah. it's just because he wanted to he wanted to put it in there in my life in my punk rock world mm -hmm. i have like ladies that are married to ladies and like rude boys married to rude boys so there's a lot of diversity that I have, of course, seen, but I'm in the I'm in the New York City world, so it's completely natural for like everyone of every background and every look. And then, you know, I, I feel in my heart when it comes to counterculture and punk rock is that you need to be authentically who you are, mm -hmm. and that's you just need to you just need to be who you are. Hmm. So yeah, the idea behind punk is like fuck everybody else. This is how we live our life. Totally. And so there's never. Really so my group of friends, it's like every we had all different types of the types of people. So when I watch the movie, it's a beautiful representation of what I see, uh, what I see in my in my life and my scene that everyone's there. 
and then we love everybody and they're all our friends that's the way it's supposed to be yes, now, uh, all over the world by the way yeah it, well we're, we're, it's 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 progress is a an, an extremely slow process unfortunately in this world right now but uh i think hopefully more people are jumping on the train of uh what well, well, at least we're, what we're trying to put down in this mm-hmm. podcast at least right now <laughs> now um when you were shopping, uh, shopping the ranger around the film festivals and things like this, and this is something I don't get to talk to a lot of people about, but what is kind of like the, the shopping, the film, like if you compare it to something like South by Southwest or a Toronto film festival or a Sundance or even a Cannes, like what are people, I mean, they're all vastly different film festivals. They're all film festivals, but what is kind of like the vibe like when you're shopping a, a genre piece? We sent it around to Film Fest when it was getting sort of, I mean, we were still in editing phases for some stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's South by Southwest that that gra- grabbed onto it. See, all the Film Fests that you mentioned, though, they're all very different. If you yeah. premiere at any of them, or like Venice and Berlin, mm-hmm. all the other Film Fests around the world are going like, what is this film mm-hmm. that just premiered at su- these, these special sort of Film Fests, like the first year Film Fest, I think South by Southwest is it's, and it's, it's, and it's, it's on its own category. I love mm-hmm. South by Southwest so much because it also has like the music part of it. So I just yeah. see late and then you get to see like sick of it all, like the Vans tents. Oh maybe. yeah, some old school New York hit hardcore. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's good. I may see them on Saturday. <laughs> oh, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm a little jealous of that then. So. Why people have that band tattooed all over them because they are that good. So once you premiere at a great film festival like that, I did the first uh, 20 film fest run. That's, uh, you know, ne- negotiating the terms of that, moving around the DCP, getting the PR um, the, the PR material uh, shown. But I felt because the Ranger slasher film proletariat subgenre mm-hmm. punk rock movie it has to go on tour because yeah. it needs to reach all the horror people all of the punk rock people all over the world because when i think genre mm-hmm. I think global i think of all my brothers and sisters internationally and we all went heart when i was at can recently i was with you know all the different folks who run film fest all over the world and I even my like hardcore Jersey City self is that I'm incredibly moved that we all have this one heart towards genre because a lot of times big fancy film fest don't want your horror film big fancy film fest don't want your zombie film (laughs) but there's a place created internationally where we can all enjoy and celebrate genre recently at the scary stories to tell in the dark with del toro Mm -hmm. He was, you know, talking about that we are evangelical, we're apostles for this medium. This is not the jumping off point for a career for a lot of us. It's something that we desperately love. And I hold sacred and dear to my heart genre the same way I do I do punk rock. So I want to get these movies in the hands of much people as possible. We then asked Yellow Veil Pictures, my friend Joe, who, by the way, helped me the first 20 because he told me how to do it (laughs) of course (laughs) and he ran he ran the the rest of them and we were in all these different places jen got flown around i tried to out of you know my own scrooge money bin go with jen as many places as possible to support the film women on stage punk rock women on stage for the for the festival and i was honored that it was embraced i am honored that our social media on twitter Mm -hmm. People love it. People talk about it. People interact with it. I love that with all my and my friend's crazy merch ideas that (laughs) when they had the little shutter giveaway, someone went like, what decade did this film come out in? It's like, we've done it. (laughs) The decade is 1990. We blurred the lines, of course. Yes. 1993, the Ranger came out. (laughs) I guess that was was the whole, whole idea. And just seeing the record now, and the record looks like it's a dollar bin record. But awesome. I, when I saw it at Creep Records on Saturday, and I thanked Eric profusely and Josh from Apocalypse, who was able to give me a record deal in two hours, bless <laughs> his heart. I asked him, it's like, it's like, we need a record deal. And he calls me up in two hours. It's like, Creep Records will do it. It's the best. Cool. It's the best. So that's having, having a record out for the movie, I'm trying to angle to get a cassette. I know we have a VHS, but a cassette of the soundtrack is important because then I can put it right next to my Chainsaw 3 cassette. Nice. Friends. 
it, it's and it's it's funny to me how cassettes are making a come. I mean, I, I had so many cassettes, and now I, I knew it would. I, I knew it would because of the VHS. The, you know, once VHS kind of took back off and everything like that, everything you know, analog is the way that everybody like likes to go. And maybe it's just like I mean, I'm a collector. I love fucking collecting things. So yes. just having things like that is just it. It works so well. And everybody who grew up in our or in our era who grew up with VHS or cassettes or anything like that, the pre CD kids and everything like that, everybody wants these things on the old medium. And and the artwork always looks awesome and. This is such an awesome throwback, too. I have never, the whole reason, okay, so I was, I believe, one of the first females to write about VHS collecting 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. because I would go to these places, and I would be so emotionally swept up that it's like, I can buy this for a (laughs) dollar. These movies that I coveted that were like $99 when I was a little girl, there's no amount of allowance money. That's mm-hmm. going to get you these things. And so I started buying them. And I go, are other people buying them? And that's when Lunch Meat just premiered. I have the first edition of Lunch Meat in black and white, wow. Xerox copy, because it because it ran out. Josh gave it to me. That's when I knew when the Rangers, since this is an 80s throwback, mm-hmm. needed a VHS release. It could only be Mr. Josh from Lunch Meat, who did an amazing job. And again, very, very emotional looking at that VHS I hear because there's much clamoring that there's going to be another run. I'm very excited about that. Very cool. Very what, what, was, what, what was your initial initial run of VHS that you guys did? It was right before Shudder was... It's right before Shudder was, and it was about like a month and a half before Shudder. And so we had some that was that were made for pre-order just to test the waters because I did... I was able to get VHS rights for the for the for the film, mm-hmm. which I actually asked for, it's on the contract, it's ridiculous. So, <laughs> so I, had, I had VHS rights and I just wanted to, as a, as a commitment to this film being a throwback film, it's like I wanted to put it out on VHS. Like even if there was three VHS that existed, and let me tell you, when I saw the test tape of the <laughs> Ranger, which is pan and scan, by the way. Oh, old school, boxed, I love pan and scan. Pan and scan. <laughs> I was pan and scan, and I was looking at it. It was gorgeous, and it's like this is this is so great. And Josh did a great job with the art. He designed it. There's a little horror sticker on there. They were colored inside, and so there was some out there. But there was a great momentum of like there was a VHS run, but I want it. it's like so we're gonna do another run. It's gonna be great. And I hear with the vinyl if that sells out, there's gonna be other runs of that as well because we have the the dual one, which has the score and the musics and all the songs, the country and punk songs. Mm-hmm. And then there's one that just has the regular, just the regular soundtrack, which is pink vinyl. The, uh, yeah. the double one is black. And then if they do other runs, those are going to be other colors as well, which I, which I adore and love. Right. Yeah, um, the, cassette. the cassette is the next, is the next thing to do. We can keep going on. Like you could do pencils. I could do a trapper keeper folder. I, I, I think you need to do something like you, you mentioned Lisa Frank earlier, something in the guise of like a Lisa Frank do a tang trapper keeper folder yes. or something like that. Yes. That's a de- That's one reason why I wanted Erica from atomic cotton to do the t-shirts because it's like I said, listen, it should look like I bought a trapper keeper in the mall and this is the artwork for the ranger. And in her heart, I think she produces that sort of style anyway. And her t-shirt was gorgeous. I was like, again, incredibly moved to when I got when I saw the t-shirt, it's like I have a t-shirt. Because think of it like I convention kid going to like weekend of horrors, going to horror hound, go to chiller. And mm-hmm. the idea that there is a ranger t-shirt. Convention <laughs> near you. I just can't. How can you even? This All is, this stuff the is dream like, has come you? true. Right. <laughs> Central asked you to write for them. Fangoria. You can't. You can't. That's how I feel. That's how I feel with with all of this, <laughs> and and the love for it, the engagement on Twitter. That my own counterculture loves the movie The Ranger. I didn't yes. even. I just wanted to make sure, like, I was keeping counterculture holy in the film, like where I could, and that there would be an outpouring of love there. All the bands that gave us their music, mm. like, this, there's a there's a true eternal gratitude for for all of this, down to like people who watch the film, who just watch the film. They don't even have to like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just watch it it's like thank you for, for thank you for doing it i mean it's a just it's, it's a it's a small film and it's just it what was very exciting for me like during the film press one because i was with jen people going up to jen 
girls almost in tears because she did something that was impossible. That means mm. girl horror film director first film. Yeah. And they were so moved that she could do it, they could do it. They understand sort of the, the girl coded content around like identity in the film. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's so, it's so great because Jen, she needs all, she deserves, I want her to have all the, all the love possible for this, for what she did. And it, it affected girldom. I mean, it's like everybody's trying to find the thing that they can identify with. And that's always been like the argument with like everything from comic books to film, you know, a lot of people like in comic books, you didn't have a lot of, you know, African-American superheroes or female superheroes or anything like that. It was all just a bunch of muscular white guys with problems and nobody can identify with all that. So now it's like, you're seeing so much, I, I say so much in the, in the scheme that we still have a long, long way to go to have all 100% inclusive inclusivity with everything. But it's great to see that people are coming up to Jen or, you know, coming up to her and like, you know, like you're saying tears in their eyes saying, thank you for making something that's for women by women and will do something for women. You know, and it's. Well, I think I would thing. almost, I would almost change that a little because the ranger is for everyone, but within the everyone category, because it's punk rock film, horror yeah, film. Okay. Film, yeah. Film, it's for everybody, but within that space, women can find themselves. Yeah. All can find themselves and go and go. This, this, the genesis of this was 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 female. The 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 lens is female because mm -hmm. it's 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 almost. It's almost subconscious that that's in the film because they came up and they talked about it, but it's not something that it's like wearing on its sleeve. It's yeah, it's not beating actual. you over the head with this. Like you're gonna fucking listen to this because this is what it is. It's like it's, it's in the it's in the fabric when you hire different people. And what I noticed is that in my advertising days is that when you're in a room with people from different backgrounds and different experiences, and they're looking at creative, the work is always better. The work is always better because if we want to tell the stories of the world, we need everybody's voices and everyone's eyes. And that's what I'm in it for when I look at any sort of art. It's like, I want to know about the world. I want to know about everyone's experiences. And also there's a universality to, to mm -hmm. the experiences as well, which is why it's incredibly, incredibly critical. And I myself like a visual artist, which is a very solo thing like writing or, or, or drawing. And so for me to say, it's like collaboration, other voices, everyone's voices, everyone's voices people it does make the life better and again cheering for cheering for diversity and i always say a big part of diversity is like we can cheer all we want but someone has to like write the fucking check it's like write the check yes. get these voices out there get these mm -hmm. voices out there it's critical for humanity and culture to do that yeah there's a lot of there's so many perspectives and i and i guess like the big uh, the big argument that people were making a couple of weeks ago with the film, you know, getting off horror for a minute, but like the film book smart and everybody was very upset with the box office totals for that film. It was like, you know, female led uh, comedy, you know, especially with one uh, of the female leads, you know, um, playing uh, um, uh, somebody from uh, an LGBT member. And then of course, Olivia Wilde directing it. And then everybody just kind of lost their minds about it not making money and things like that. So still got tons of ways to go, but you know, we're, we're getting there and ho hopefully, like you said, cut the fucking check, keep making these movies. Not everything has to be a get big giant goddamn 10 pole movie that makes you know, a billion dollars across the world. There's smaller stories that make a bigger impact. A lot of people down the line. So. Yes. And if you think like God, my voice is not going to not gonna be heard. I, I want everyone's voice to be heard. I want you to not give up. Your voices will be heard. Everyone's. Yep. Uh, make your make your fucking movie. Be be a little Heather. And make your own goddamn fucking little movie Do too. Something. Do be something. your be your own little Jen and make your own movie. You know what I mean? It's like, it's it's out there, and especially now these these days. Well, well some people don't have the financial privilege to do that, and yeah. all that, that. So this is why I'm hoping for the system to be more open to green light stuff. That there's other other avenues for a larger expression that everyone can participate. That's why I love social media. People mm -hmm. can write things. People can participate, and you want to sort of like promote it and bring it up. So again, yeah. learn about the world. Want other voices. Especially, you know, in the in the in the genre, I love all the all the different types of horror fans all over the world. 
Absolutely. I'll We're a there. big fucking family. Every, we are. Everyone is welcome to the table. We're a big, sick fucking family, but we're a family at the end of the day. It's like the chainsaw family. Which yeah, I, I was about to say, you took the words right out of my goddamn mouth. So. <laughs> chainsaw families luck. They're like punk rock family because chainsaw families accept who you are and they're artists and all, all the great stuff that we Absolutely. should do. Yes. And um, another thing, I, I mean, we're kind of kind of winding down here, but I was just kind of looking through a small portion of just, you know, female directors in general. Like, a lot of people, I think, always kind of forget that Catherine Bigelow, one of her first big movies, was like, you know, near dark of, you know, mm-hmm. cowboy, cowboy vampires out on the plane and everything. And, you know, Mary Lambert making pets, the original Pet Cemetery. Not that I'm, I'm a... I'm, I just wasn't a big fan of the remake, but that's me. So it is what it is. And then of course, uh, Kimberly Pierce doing the Carrie remake and, you know, even, you know, Anna Lily, uh, uh, Amarpour doing like the girl walks alone at night and things like that. So we, luckily there are some voices out there, but I mean, that's such a small portion. And I mean, if you dig that dig in deeper, there's more, but you know, Jordan Peele, you know, of course he, everybody likes to credit him now as like kind of breaking the door down. It's like, look, we can have stories about the African-American experience told from the African-American perspective. But before that you had, you know, Rusty Cundiff doing things like from Tales from the Hood and things like that. Um, Over the course of, I don't know, let's say that's like about 25 years or something like that. Like how far are we from getting as close as we can to having a big impact made by voices that just have been ignored for so long, you think? I, I, I can't even, I can't even put a time on it. Cause I do tell people cynically that I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, when I, when I die, our society will still be ingrained with sexism and racism because it is ingrained in our culture. So very deeply in the, in the fat and the fabric of it, of the heart of it, people sometimes don't even know that they're doing it. Some people do know that they're, that they're, that they're doing it subconscious and conscious. So it's really, so it's a really hard thing to uh, think, think to solve. So all I could say is that, um, I'm, I'm there. I try to pick diverse voices from my slate and the stuff that, that goes out in the world. Mm-hmm. I try to look for different commentators and, you know, people to talk about genre. Like on my Candyman disc, I have, I have from the English perspective, like sort of the Stevie King perspective, the African-American uh, perspective, talking about cinema telling people they need to invite other people out there. So it's just, I feel like I'm in, they got to remind, people are still reminding each other that there's other folks that have great, great background to talk about genre, to participate. Like even a critical sense, mm-hmm. reviews, commentary. I mean, it's hard. I can't give you time. It's like right now, yeah. we're like reminding of people's phases that you you have a panel at a convention and there's mm-hmm. no one of color on there and there's no one, you know, with different experiences. Yeah. It's been a battle. It's been a battle for you know, over 50 years. Everybody always remembers, you know, Night of the Living Dead being kind of like the touchstone of breaking down, you know, the, the so-called color barrier on, on a lot of horror films, even though we had, of course, horror films before Night of the Living Dead, but... You know, hopefully at some point we're going to get there. And if anything, horror is always the genre of the downtrodden and the people that can't say a lot of things. And as long as we keep making good horror films, hopefully that will shine through. And be a punk, be a fucking punk rocker about it. Just go out there and do it yourself and do your own fucking thing too. So um, that's what I would say. Hallelujah to a little bit too. So. <laughs> Well, Heather, really appreciate the the time you've given me. You've been wonderful uh, to talk to. Thank you so much for all the little tidbits and all the all the stories and everything like that. Um, it's been wonderful to just chat with you for a no, while. I feel I feel very I feel very honored to have this conversation. Very very cool. Well, hey, um, I'm gonna let you plug whatever you feel like you need to plug. Uh, talk about the ranger talk about anything else talk about any any projects that you may want to tease or talk about uh before before we get on out of here if you have anything at all that is well watch the ranger and tell me what you thought about it on all the social media platforms that exist support and love miss jen wexler our, our 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 director and fearless leader buy the novelization that my friend Ed Kurtz wrote, get the t-shirt and then the, and then the vinyl support creep records and independent of vinyl. So do, so do that. 
and um you know keep on watching horror movies listening to your to your punk rock you know and do what do what's right do what is right well again heather thank you so much for your time you've been a wonderful guest on another edition of simplistic interviews you can uh, you know, download the podcast on iTunes, on Stitcher Radio, everything, everywhere where you can find the Simplistic Review podcast. Of course, visit the website, simplisticreviews.net. Follow us on all major social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, everything else in between. And we will be back next time with another Simplistic Interview. Have a good night, everyone.